is with us in, a, in our virtual space today. So my name is Emily Vale. I'm the executive director of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance, and we host this watershed breakfast lecture series every second Thursday of the month. Um, this year, our series is focused on state opportunities for implementing watershed projects, focused both on technical assistance and grant opportunities. So we want to thank um, NUIPIC and the Hudson River Estuary Program for supporting this program today, along with the others in this series. A couple of announcements from the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. We want to thank our longtime board members, Mary McNamara, Phil Degatano, and Ryan Palmer, who served on our board of directors for nine years, each in significant leadership roles, and they reached term limits this year. So we are looking for new board members. And if you're interested in learning more about the role and the process, you can check out some more information on our website. Also wanted to mention that next month we will be back here on Zoom uh, on Thursday, March 9th, 830 to 930, and we will feature Hudson River Greenway grants as our state opportunity and learn more about opportunities for municipalities to get funding for planning that supports water and watersheds. So keep an eye out for uh, more details, but we do have a registration link that's open uh, and, and we'll be talking more about Greenway. Greenway grants. Great. So we'll go ahead and get started with the program. And I'd like to introduce Beth Ressler, Trees for Trips coordinator from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation Hudson River Estuary Program to provide an overview of the Hudson Estuary Trees for Trips Program. Great. Thank you, Emily. Um, I'm going to get my screen up. All right, Can everybody see my screen there? Get my other people out of the way here. Okay, so as Emily mentioned, my name is Beth Ressler from the Hudson River Estuary Program, which is part of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And we work in collaboration with the New York State Water Resources Institute at Cornell. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the Hudson Estuary Trees for Trips Program. Um, first, I want to talk about uh, the estuary program who I work for. Um, our goal is to help people enjoy, protect, and revitalize the Hudson River and its valleys. And we do that um, under these benefit categories that you see here um, with the help um, or with the guidance of our Hudson River Estuary Action Agenda, uh, which you can see on that screen there. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is the Hudson Estuary Trees for Trips, and you're going to get a lot more detail, but in a nutshell, we provide free trees and shrubs for you and your volunteers to plant along tributary streams or the tribs um, in the Hudson Estuary watershed. So um, I want to step back for a second. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but why do we do this? Why do we want healthy stream buffers, which is what we're doing, those planted areas along the streams? Um, and if you want more detail, I'm going to give a plug for the Hudson River Watershed Alliance's Stream Buffer Protection Webinar Series that was done in 2020. It gives a great, there's, there's a whole presentation on this one slide, um, and also a lot of the other things I'm going to cover today in much more detail. So, um, so those healthy buffers, uh, they prevent uh, stream pollution. So they're, they're like these sponges. They filter the runoff before it gets into the stream. So keep the pollution from getting into the stream, reducing the erosion of the sediment along the stream, um, help maintain that stream health. The, the, the roots and, and the shade um, are really good for the, what the critters that are using the stream itself. Reduce flooding and damage. Um, so the damage from flooding from those mo fast moving waters prevents some of the water from getting in. Uh, recharging groundwater, um, very unique wildlife habitat, really important to a lot of different animals out there um, and birds and, and all of the like. Um, recreation, so you're, you're kayaking, you're walking the trails along the stream, all of those sorts of things. Um, and there have been studies that show that having healthy buffers also improves uh, property value. Um, so there's other benefits, and I tell these sort of my community benefits. Education, it's a great way to get people out um, to see the stream and you know community engagement, a way to talk to get people out to talk and, and get their hands dirty and think about their streams and how they take care of them. Um, if you are a community with an MS4, um, if you don't know what that is, um, it's a multiple uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, municipal separated storm sewer system. If you don't know, that's okay. But if you're working on those programs and you have an MS4, you know that there are requirements you need to meet. Um, and planting a buffer is can be used to meet some of the education requirements. Um, if you have a local open space plan or a watershed plan, this is an opportunity to maybe implement something that's in that plan. Um, if you are a climate smart community, you can get points for planting a buffer um, within, it's one of the actions within that. Um, and if you don't know about it, I recommend that you look up climate smart communities and learn more. So um, what makes a healthy stream buffer? So this slide is really, it's really important to think about what, this is what we're, we're aiming for with this program when we're trying to plant along those streams. Um, so it's, it's diverse. There's lots of native vegetation with different sizes and shapes of plants. Um, so we're looking at lots of different species, shrubs, trees, grasses, flowers, all those things. Um, it's wide. Uh, so this picture at the top here, you can see there's a sort of a very narrow buffer on the left hand side and a much wider one on the right. We're aiming for something more like the right. Um, science tells us that we want a hundred foot buffer as a minimum to get the best, the most out of our functioning, the most functions out of our, our buffers. And so that's kind of, we're aiming for much wider um, and that's gonna come up again in this presentation. Um, shady, in most of this, the areas of the Hudson Valley, we're really looking at forested buffers, um, tall trees, putting shade on the stream and messy, I put it in quotes, um, I think this is one of the biggest the biggest concerns that we sometimes have. People want to make things neat in this sort of traditional um, landscaping kind of way. And really, honestly, that's not that's not what we're aiming for with this. And, and that comes up a lot with, with landowners who are interested in or participating. We're really trying to get lots of things going on at once. And we might have some trees that are a little bit bent or a little bit sideways. And as long as they're not um, putting anyone in harm's way, that's actually the way that buffers look. Um, so really quickly, we've been around since 2007, and we've help, helped plant almost 400 sites, 66,000 plants. Um, but most importantly, um, we've done that with the help of 9,700 and probably, probably more uh, volunteers. We are a staff of two and a half, um, and there's no way that we could do all of this without the volunteers to help us. So they're the real workers um, for, for our program. So uh, really quickly, if you think that you would like to apply for our program, how do you apply? And I'm gonna talk more later about what's eligible and, and how you would sort of find out if, if your site is right. But you would just complete this short two page application. You can sort of see an example there. Um, we're asking for some really general site information. What does it look like? What's there now? What are you trying to achieve? Some maps and photos of the area. So mapping out specifically where you think you wanna plant. Um, and again, we can have a conversation with you about it after the fact. So what you put in there is just the start of the conversation. We do need a landowner signature. That is a very important part that just sort of um, from the point of view of giving out money, we just have to have that, that agreement from the landowner. Um, and then you can send it to us by email or fax or in the mail. Um, by, we need it by March 1st if you want to plant in the spring, which means planting in about May, um, or August 1st if you want to plant in the fall, which is basically usually around October. Um, so what makes an eligible project? Project. This is the basis. This is this is the minimum. Um, it needs to be along a water body. You know, we're we're trees for trips, so we need we need a stream or a lake um, or some other water body. Um, it can be on public or private land. Um, a lot of pictures you're gonna see are on public land, but we do plant on private land as well. So either is fine. Um, in the program boundary, so I've got the map in there again, um, and you can find that map on our website as well. Um, the minimum now, and this is actually new for those who've been working with us for years, this has changed a little bit. We're, we're setting the minimum as a 20 foot width. So that's 20 foot, away from the stream, so perpendicular to your stream, uh, and up to 300 feet wide, um, and large enough to plant at least 60 plants. Uh, this is something we sort of loosely did in the past, but we're now um, enforcing this. Um, and I'm not going to get into the square footage. It's something that if you want to contact me with more questions, but usually to get 60 plants, you need um, about 2,200 square foot if you're only doing shrubs, which can be put closer together, and about 6,000 square feet if you're only doing trees. Um, 
And I'm happy to talk to people offline if you have questions about specific size sites. Um, and the last one, I'm not really going to define it exactly, but it needs to be plantable. So if it's extremely steep and no, there's no way you would want volunteers there or the soil is so hard you can't get a shovel through it, um, there might be some things that need to be done before we can work on that project. Um, we do point out some sites that are specifically not eligible, and I do want to mention that not eligible does not mean that you shouldn't plant them. It just means that you won't be able to plant them with the estuary, Hudson Estuary Trees for Trips program. Um, it's just not what we're designed to do. So um, any stormwater practices, drainage ditches or built structures, we can't do those or separated from the stream by, by those structures. So there's an example here that would not be eligible because there's a big road between the lake and the planting area. Um, Large scale projects. So if you're doing a large scale stream channel realignment or taking down a lot of plants um, to put in sewer lines or something like that, um, it's not that those don't need plants, but we think that you should, uh, the, the kinds of funding that, that give, that you can get for those practices should include the opportunity to pay for plants from the very beginning. And so we don't wanna be giving those plants to those sites. And I can talk to you if you're not sure about your site. Um, any area that's already enrolled in a program that gives you plants for planting long streams or helps pay for those plants, um, again, feel free to talk to me offline if you have a project. Um, so these days, we're actually getting more applications than we're able to fulfill in any given season. And so we've, we've sort of set out some priorities. Um, so high priority sites are going to be along a stream as opposed to a lake or a wetland um, or a pond. Uh, they're going to be larger and wider, again, because the science tells us we get more out of that. They're going to have a volunteer educational component. Um, be publicly visible, so maybe public land or land that can be seen from the road or something. And that's because we really want that educational piece. We want people to see, uh, see these sites and learn from them. Um, if it's a local priority in a watershed plan, an open space plan, or other local plan, um, and if we feel it's more likely to succeed, again, I haven't defined that completely, but if you already have a maintenance plan or you already know you have volunteers, sort of proving to us that you know you can do it. Um, lower priority projects, again, this doesn't mean that they shouldn't be planted, but just that they, for our specific program and our abilities, um, anything that's along a lake, a pond, a wetland, or the Hudson River itself, because we are focused on the tributaries, um, smaller or narrower sites, um, any place where the runoff bypasses the proposed planting area. So if you've got a big ditch that's taking all your water around it, you don't get that filtering when the water is bypassing the, the planting area. Um, if there's a lot of existing tree and shrub cover, um, and we can have long debates about whether whether how important it is to have understory, and I do think it's really important, but we have proved that our program is not very good at restore, excuse me, restoring those understory areas. Um, and so we've been shying away from those plantings and, and trying to find other ways to help people with those sites. Um, if you have a lot of invasive plants on your site and they haven't been controlled at all and you have no plan to control them, that's gonna be a lower priority. However, if you have that site, feel free to reach out to us. We can try to help you find resources uh, through other, uh, other groups to try to deal with some of those invasive plants before we're putting in those na the natives. So I have a couple of quick examples just so um, to give you some ideas of our priorities and eligibility. So this is an application we got, I think back in 2015, uh, 30,000 30, square feet, and they want to do a hundred foot wide buffer, I think on both sides. And this was identified as a priority already in a local watershed plan. So this is pretty easy. This is a high priority site and we did plant it. Um, and if we have time at the end, I've got some pictures of it. Um, here's a site. They wanted to do 100 square feet and 50 feet wide. So, so far it's eligible, but it does have full tree cover and it is along a lake. And so this is a site that we would call a low priority. So you can apply, but if we had a lot of applications that year, it's possible that we might not be able to give you plants. And uh, by the way, I didn't say this before, but I'm gonna give you some other options if our program is not the right one because you're a low priority or you're not eligible. There are definitely other options for vegetating your buffer. Um, so here's a site, uh, 1200 square feet, 15 feet wide full. So right away, we're not meeting the area requirements or the the, the um, uh, the width requirements. And so it's too small, too narrow. And I wanted to point out, so I was talking about drainage where the bypasses the planting. So if we're trying to treat the runoff from this 
parking lot and that runoff is going straight down this ditched area, uh, the, the buffer is going to be less effective at that. Um, I will say this particular site is, is sort of a trick site because we did plant it because there's a much bigger area upstream of it that we were able to plant. So this was just one part of a bigger project. And so that's one way if you have, an, have a small property and your neighbor also wants to enroll, um, we might be able to make that into one project, uh, which is fine as long as I have a signature from both landowners. Um, so I, I mentioned there are other plant sources out there. If you have a small site, I'm going to highly recommend Buffer in a Bag. So this is also a program of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, um, and we're going to put a link to that in the chat. Um, you get one bag of 25 trees and shrub seedlings. They're bare roots, so there's the bag there in the picture. Um, you must have 50 feet of, of along the, of waterfront property for this, this program as well. But it's it's sort of on your own. Um, but but it's a great way to get started, um, and you can apply to both Buffer and Bag and our program at the same time if you like. You can also apply to Buffer and a Bag multiple years in a row. Um, the Saratoga Tree Nursery is the place where both Buffer and a Bag and My Trees for Trips program get our plants. So and they have a spring seedling sale, so you can buy plants as well. And those are the exact same plants you'd be getting from us. Um, that. Um, sale opens in January, um, and they, they are starting to sell out now, um, and you get your plants in the spring, so usually uh, late April or May. Local private nurseries may also have plants that you can buy, um, and I just want to mention for those who have really large projects um, or, or multiple projects in an area, there are quite a few other state and federal grants, and I don't have time to go through that today, but once again, I'm giving a plug for the Watershed Alliance's Stream Buffer Protection Webinar Series. Um, there, there's lots of great resources, including a whole presentation about state and federal grants that, that uh, can be used for buffer support. Um, so let's say you did put an application. Um, the next the next step is a site visit and a planting plan. So we'll come out, walk the site with you, maybe take some measurements, find out more about your goals. And then we will spit back to you uh, a maybe a list of recommended plants and a very simple planting plan. So this is a whole site here on the side. And we're just saying, you know, closer to, this, to the edge of the, the water, we're gonna do some of these faster growing and then different species moving back. So that's about the detail that you're probably going to get from us. We may also be able to come and help you with the layout on the day of, but we can have a conversation about this. And so you'll get, you'll have, this is, this is the beginning of a conversation. And if you're not happy with, with the, what we've given you, you can tell us what things you'd like to change and we'll do our best depending on what we have. Um, and so what do we usually have? Um, so in any given season, we have about 40 or more native species. Um, they're all trees and shrubs. We do not do um, flowers, grasses, and other herbaceous plants. That doesn't mean they're not a great idea uh, for planting along streams. Um, it's just not, we don't have the capacity for that. We can give you recommendations if you wanna do that on your own. Um, the plants that we have available are different every season. So I can't tell you now what we're gonna have available, um, but, uh, if there are specific plants that you want, please tell us on your application and we'll do the best we can to try to obtain those. Um, they're all native, so we are we, we do restrict ourselves to natives. Um, one to three year old seedlings, the vast majority of our plants are that. And you can see the various sizes and shapes there. And all of the plants that we're giving now are all going to be potted. Um, we used to do bare roots, but we don't do that anymore. Um, that means you can keep them a little bit longer. You have a little more time to get them in the ground. Um, so those sizes, we're asking everybody to take the smallest and the largest ones. Um, we try to give everybody a variety. We are not able to give you all of the biggest ones. I know we'd all love to have that one uh, tulip tree that's that's seven feet tall. Um, and I will say some years we don't have anything even that big. Uh, it just sort of depends on what the nurseries are able to give us. Um, and so what you will get depends on what we have and also the conditions on your site. So we try to match those things. Um, the other thing that we can provide is tree tubes for, and they're really important for protecting your plants. Um, you can see the, if you can see my mouse there, there's, there's that little tiny plant there and we've put it into this plastic tube. It protects from deer. That's the main thing that we're protecting from, but it also actually increases the, the, um, 
the growth rate. Uh, they're designed for that. And so, and, and we want you to leave them on for many years. Um, if you do not like tubes, you can protect the plants in your own way if you want to put in a fence or other kinds of protection. But we do ask that you protect them because we don't want to put them in the ground and then have them be deer food. Um, so here's a picture of those tubes out in the field. That's 110 trees. Um, you can see the spacing with trees. And then I'll show you another one. Here's the spacing with shrubs. They're a little bit closer together. Yes, we did put shrubs in tubes. Um, and that's what we're doing these days because uh, we're finding it's necessary. So, um, so we've given you a planting plan. We've all agreed to it. On the day of the planting, we can provide, we can deliver the plants to you. We can give you some advice about layout, help you get them laid out. We can do a demonstration for your volunteers, show them how to plant, how to put on those tubes. Um, and we may be able to provide some tools um, that, that depends on the site and the timing. Um, you need to provide the volunteers or, or other type of labor. So if your DPW wants to do the work, that's fine with us, but we are not the planters. Um, we are there to advise you and help you. Um, and just no, no uh, presentation would be complete without some pictures of some happy volunteers getting a little muddy. And whether your site has two or 50, um, we'll work with you either way. Um, and I wanted to mention maintenance um, that is up to the applicant. Um, we recommend a minimum of two visits per year. Um, we also recommend that you assess the site after storm events um, and water if there's dry times like last year. Um, uh, otherwise, you're going to be removing competition, cleaning and straightening tubes, um, assessing plant health. If you find things, you can you can contact us or contact your lo local master gardeners, um, and you know we can try to we can try to get you resources. Um, and if you're having if you you do lose some plants, we do have the opportunity to help you replant if needed. Just contact us, and we'll have a conversation about it. Um, and we are trying to get back to those sites. So our staff is trying to get back to every site, um, basically at least once after or after one growing season. So that might be one year or one and a half years, depending on whether you plant in spring or fall. We'll be assessing the survival. We'll be learning from you about what you think you need or what you're confused about and making recommendations for how you can do maintenance better. Um, and just some quick before and after shots. So this is a site that we did in Voorheesville. We planted it in 2009 at that location and you can see the after um, in 2018. And this is what it looks like on the ground, a little bit messy, uh, like high, low, and it's gonna keep getting better over time. And that all used to be a mowed lawn. Uh, again, mowed lawn, this is uh, Millbrook Schools in Millbrook. Uh, 2016, we planted this area. And that's what it looks like now. Um, and this is what it looks like on the ground. Lots of great, great, uh, right after we planted it in 2016 and then in 2022, lots of great fall color there. And that's it for me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I think we'll be taking um, questions after the other presentation. That's right. Thank you so much, Beth, for your presentation. Uh, as Beth mentioned, we will be taking questions after both of the presentations. If you have questions during the talks, feel free to use the Q&A box so we can keep track of those. Great. OK, so next up, I'd like to introduce Chet Kerr, chair of the Greater Irvington Land Trust, and Sue Galloway from Dobbs Ferry, who will present on their work with Trees for Tribs along the Sawmill River in a new park in the village of Dobbs Ferry. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, we get the pleasure to talk about today uh, how this program how is put in action and, and how it's really helped us as we've tried to work on developing this new park in, in the village of Dobbs Ferry. So let me see if I can share my screen. Just get this out of the way. One second. On the second, there we go. Okay. So, um, uh, as, as, as I said, I, I am Chet Kerr. I'm with. I work with the uh, um, Greater Irvington Land Trust in in the Irvington and Dobbs Ferry area. Sue Galloway is with me, who is a longtime member of the Conservation Advisory Board 
Uh, we work together along with Groundworks Hudson Valley, which is an incredibly wonderful group working at, uh, along the Sawmill River in the lower Westchester area. And uh, this program uh, was uh, brought to us, I think Sue really identified it for us as a real example of what we can do uh, to really build on our goals of expanding this new park. So um, this is a, a picture, a map of Dobbs Ferry, which is a, a small village in uh, uh, Westchester, uh, just below the, uh, the new uh, Mar Mario Cuomo Bridge. Uh, it's a, about 11,000 people. It's about a three square mile. It's about 20 miles north of New York City. It's a commuter town of the Hudson Metro North Line and a mix of single family homes and uh, multifamily homes. And they have some larger wooded areas, uh, but a lot of the parks have traditionally been right along the Hudson River and not uh, along the Sawmill River, which, uh, which is, runs right down through here. And um, about three or four years ago, uh, a resident of Dobbs Ferry who lived up in this area in an area called Hickory Hill raised this question about what is this open area right along here that seems to be left and abandoned um, and what is it and what can we do with it? And it turned out that this was um, property that would, part of it was owned by the village, uh, this parcel down here and this parcel up here. And then this long parcel in between is a parcel that was owned by the state of New York. It was originally acquired back in the 1920s when they were building the Sawmill River Parkway, but never really used for that. And working with the village of Dobbs Ferry, uh, kind of thinking about options, what to do, we came up with a plan to create a new park, uh, basically seeing if the DOT would transfer that large state-owned property back to the village and combining it with the other two parcels, this one and that one, to create one new 14 acre park. Um, there's a small, this runs right along the Sawmill River, which is right there. And this is the one place where the Sawmill River runs on the west side of the Sawmill River Parkway and provides kind of unique access to the river. There's a small stream that runs right down from here into the Sawmill River. And it uh, it's often can become flooded and there's additional flooding issues down river. There is some shade and some direct sunlight and a mixture of native ferns and uh, skunk cabbage, lizard tail and aggressive, but there's aggressive invasives as well. A lot of Japanese knotweed, still grass, some porcelain berry and bittersweet vines. So trying to think of a way of working with that area and what can we do with it, the Trees for Chips program uh, is actually perfect. So our goals were to introduce this range of native trees and shrubs that crowd out the invasives. There's a fair amount of invasives in the area. Uh, and the goal was to strengthen the soil and the riverbank and absorb water to reduce flooding and provide food source for pollinators and birds. We have challenges, however, that it, it, as I said, there are existing natives invasives in there and how do we keep them out? There's a fair amount of deer pressure. And then there's flooding, uh, especially as in the springtime, as this little stream right here flows into the river, uh, that can become very flooded and causing further flooding down uh, downstream. So we are uh, working with Beth um, and uh, identified a couple of planting sites. Uh, the first one is in this purple area. The second one is in this green area. And this is his proposed because this is what we sent to Beth last year before our last planting. And, um, and this area worked for a couple of good reasons. It was right where this small stream entered into the Sumo River. It was flat. It was a flooded area. Uh, soil was pretty good, had a lot of invasives we had to deal with, but it seemed like a good spot for, um, for all of our reasons. So this is a picture of this uh, area right along this little stream. There's a small bridge that goes over it. This is looking east toward the Sawmill River. River is right about there. And you can see that it's uh, some open sunlight areas, some shaded trees around it. There's a fair amount of uh, uh, native plants. And as you get closer to the river, a lot of invasives as well. This is a... There is, this is a tree that's fallen over the Sawmill River. And this picture in the right kind of shows, you know, kind of what it was when we kind of approached this area. Uh, a lot of uh, 
uh, not weed in there and other um, stuff. And so I, it, it, the reason why this picture is really helpful, I think, is it just shows you um, approaching a site like this, thinking about possibilities. That's what this program really does. It really helps you think about possibilities and think about what it can be. So another shot of the, this little bridge that goes over this little stream. Uh, you can see it's very rocky right under here. Uh, and then this on the picture on the right again shows this little stream that goes through various little tributaries out to the river. So it's, it is wet much of the year, um, uh, but it has some open space and room for uh, sunlight to get in there. And again, this is just pictures of some of the many invasives that were there as this existing site. And again, I think these pictures are really helpful be because they really, uh, things that you might encounter that that look fairly overgrown but have a lot of invasives and how you change the dynamics of that, manage the flooding in a way that can be effective. So here are our broader goals for the park. Um, because remember, beyond just planting these plants, shrubs and trees, we were trying to create a new park in an area of the village that people were not very focused on, really didn't know a lot about. And so how could we use this program to advance those goals for us as well? And uh, one, we were attempting to create awareness and support for a new park in an area where historically there's been little community engagement. Uh, municipal government, the local village of Dobbs Ferry is very supportive of the project, but frankly is unable to provide any initial financial support. They were concerned about uh, other ongoing municipal projects. And so they were looking to have volunteers come in and really uh, provide that support. And therefore, we needed to find ways of bringing people to the site that were inexpensive, easy to understand, and engaging. And that was really an important part, be engaging. How was a way to get people out there, get dirty, as Beth said, put their hands in the soil. And we wanted to show something that had real tangible progress, something that we could bring people back to, they could see it starting to work, you know, thinking what the, the park could be uh, going forward. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sue, uh, who has been really the leader of this effort for the last couple of years. And Sue is hopefully gonna talk a little bit about how we took some of these goals and put them in practice through our um, creation materials program. So Sue, just turn your mic on, there you yeah, go. Yeah, sure, uh, thanks, Chet. Um, so uh, we, yeah, so we're approaching the site, we wanna make it um, visible and we wanna enhance, uh, restore habitat and also to, um, help to mitigate the flooding that happens at downstream from us a lot of flooding issues especially along the parkway so um this kind of helps to solve a bunch of different problems so um the ways trees for trips helps us to meet our goals so we have this new landscape so that we're we're solving those those basic problems i just talked about um but the, you know, it's got all these like facets that are helpful to us because we bring in the community um, and pretty much anybody can do it. Every time we've had a volunteer day, we'll have older people, um, people in their seventies, um, children, five-year-olds, um, there's like a mix. And um, so all sorts of people are doing it. Um, uh, I think I'm actually not sure how many times, <laughs> Beth, you guys have been able to show us how to do things, but that's always very helpful when you do. Um, but like, it's it's nice because um, once a few like kind of key people learn how to do it, then they can go around and, and help the other people to do it. It's really not that hard, um, but just to dig the hole, you put the plant in, you get the stake fitted, you put the tube on correctly, you um, tighten the zip ties, you, uh, you get the... Um, the weed mat. So I, you know, there's a process, but it's something that people can do together, basically. Um, and then for us, the immediate visual results are interesting because our site is along the Sawmill River Parkway. And so thousands of people are driving by it all the time. And every time I drive by, I, I look and I'm like, oh no, I got to put the tubes back. A couple of them fell over. I got to fix those up. But I'm, I don't think everybody thinks that. I think a lot of people think, oh, what are they doing there? What is that? So instead of it looking like, a, oh, you know, I think for some people, a big swath of green can look like nothing or, you know, to me, it's not. I say, oh, woods, beautiful habitat. But now somebody who thinks that's nothing says, oh, that's something and someone's doing something. So it, it really, I mean, like the tubes are awesome, even though, it, you know, 
you might not think that that's a benefit, but the tubes really are. And uh, and again, it's um it, it is a process that um, everybody enjoys. You know, our volunteers come up to me after, email me afterwards, and always say, you know, this was great. Please let me know when you're doing this again. Or we had a great time. You can go to the next slide, Chet. Um, and so this, I you know, you saw a few of the before pictures um, a little earlier with Chet, and now you can see these are the after pictures. Um, we uh, always, you know, on every time we've done this, we've had Groundwork Hudson Valley, who um, is, I, I think I'll talk about in the next slide, a strategic partner, basically, for us, who's helping us out. Now, they, it's not necessary to have them, but I can talk a little bit about the benefits of having them helping us out. Um, and so I only mention that because in that one photo where the volunteers are there, you can see a few people who, who work for that organization. Um, and yeah, it doesn't look perfect, but the the tubes are there. It's it's something much of the the Sawmill River Parkway. If you drive on it, you'll see a lot of vines everywhere you go. So to see an interruption of of trees just um, kind of burdened with vines and see oh there's something new happening is is pretty positive. You can go to the next slide. Um, again, um, this oh, so the, I put this photo in because I wanted you to see. I'm, I always uh, Beth will know. I always am like, should we take out all that skunk cabbage? There's so much skunk cabbage, but it's a native plant, um, and we we tend to leave it. Um, you know, you just there's plenty of it. It's not endangered or anything, so you know we sort of work around it. And you can also see some native ferns in this, um, but we just plant within there. The the soil here is actually. Um, really easy to work with. It's not like planting in a garden. This I don't know if this is how, I don't think this is how every site is, but this soil is, is really easy to dig. So, um, and stays quite moist. Um, so this has been like a, it's it's a pleasure actually to, to plant here. You can go to the next slide. Um, and then this, I wanted a photo of this one because um, where you, it sort of looks dark, but um, over on the side, this time we got almost, we got right up to the bank of the river, which we hadn't, we did um, several consecutive plantings um, where we were around the small tributary. But um, as we got up closer to the river, I don't know, it was pretty exciting for me um, because I feel like we're really supporting those goals of mitigating flooding um, downriver. Um, this area was covered in knotweed and um, and we had to have a few volunteer days where we cut the knotweed back. Um, we will see how it does uh, going forward, but it's, it's pretty well covered right now. So um, hopefully we can have a few additional volunteer days um, to kind of knock back anything that's that's sprouting up. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Um, there's Chet <laughs> and um, uh, really he looks very happy, honestly, like having a great day <laughs> and um, kneeling on the ground in a hat is Oded Holtzinger and he has been our um, contact person, I guess that's a real understatement, but our, uh, our person at Groundwork Hudson Valley and that's uh, one of the one of the workers he has and um, uh, you can go to the next slide because I think I mentioned groundwork. I'm not sure, but um, so so this is where I'm just going to talk as quickly as possible. Uh, so to implement, um, so we've applied already. Uh, we know the day's coming. So we what we have had to do is prep the area, removing invasive plants, and we do this with the support from Groundwork Hudson Valley. Um, and so they have helped us with a, a crew on that day and sometimes and, and a crew on the day of planting as well. So we're often faced with, oh, my gosh, we did not get all the invasives out. Well, that day, we'll just make sure we have five extra people. Who, and that's their goal is ripping stuff out while we're planting. Um, groundwork also helps us with the tools. Um, so that's one major way they can help. Um, you know, otherwise I have a few shovels, my neighbor has a few shovels. So like we can cobble together a few things, but having a strategic partner like Groundwork has been great because they just have a, a van full of shovels and um, and people basically. So so they, we're not too, too concerned about um, how we're going to assemble tools from our garages. Um, so the um, 
Uh, I should also mention that our location is a slight challenge because you can't drive straight there. You have to kind of, there's a walking aspect involved. So that takes up a little bit of time. And um, Chad has had to, to move everything, you know, down the hill a few times and I'm by himself and I've done it too. And it, it's, it's a good amount of work, but so having extra people around to do that is helpful. Um, the cleanup and disposal. So um, most invasive plants you can just leave on site, but Japanese knotweed should not be left on site. It should be bagged, um, not um, not taken to any green dumping, but incinerated. So we have to make we have to work with our village and make clear this has to be incinerated. Um, don't dump with green things, or else the knotweed just moves all over the place. Um, and then, so it's for the continuing maintenance. Um, that is has mostly been me, um, but groundwork also helps us with that some of the time. Um, for for this particular site, I mostly just have to restake things. Um, the watering is, uh, I think I've had to water maybe twice, but usually that area, as I said, like the soil is so damp, it's it stays pretty wet, it floods pretty frequently. The watering is not a challenge there, and probably at most sites you would use. You, we just get a big bucket or a big bottle, dump it into the stream, like pick a pick up a bunch of water from the stream and walk around and water everything. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Um, so the day of, um, that's the part that's like, you know, we have to put a bit of effort into. So what we've been doing is an event, right? Um, making sure we get the information to the newspaper and then um, either our village will send out, sometimes they'll send out a blast that includes our event. Um, also building our own email list, although I have to admit that is a bit of a challenge um, because sometimes people show up who didn't register on Eventbrite, which is like awesome, um, but it's very hard to read everybody's email when they write it on the sign-in sheet. So um, that might be just my personal problem of reading people's handwriting. But um, um, the trusted volunteers who can help others, I think is a really big part. And then um, uh, because I, I will often ask a few people who I know who you know, this person's going to definitely be there. So it's not just like me and Chet <laughs> stuck with stuff. And it never has been, but it's just nice to know when you have a few people you can really rely on. Um, so just finding a few people and, you know, they wouldn't have known they wanted to do it. Like I kind of just come up to people and I say, hey, I'm doing this project. Would you be interested in helping us? It's just going to be two hours and bring a shovel. And I, I know you're good at this type of thing. And um, most people say yes, actually. So um, so that's been a great way to. Uh, get a few extra people out. Um, we also have to get um, authorization from our village when we do projects. And so we, I have to like ahead of time, get permission to hold the event. Um, we bring out waivers to be signed. And uh, as I wanted to mention, as Beth had said before, to get a landowner signature on the application. So our village always knows about it because our village administrator has to sign the landowner section of the application. Um, so, and that's another thing that like, you have to allow time and you might may, I don't know who who's applying for things, but you may need to um, get them on board in the first place. So present the idea to them, show them some photos of befores and afters. And, and I, I did have to do a little convincing um, a couple of times. It's a win. It's absolutely a win and they, they should do it. Um, but you might just need to explain the, the project to them. You can go to the next slide. Um, oh, so um, we're on to the plant list. And so um, as Beth had showed you before, the, Beth and her team will usually send you a plant list ahead of time. They'll often ask you if you have any preferences. I never have preferences. I'm sure they know better than I do. Um, I'm just kind of along for the ride. <laughs> but um, uh, I will say um, I lost the May 2021 planting list. But um, all of these species, I would say, I love the swamp rose. It does great. And the silky dogwood, they're just like gangbusters. I would say our loss in the first year of planting, we probably lost two plants. And that was like incredible. Um, there was a really deep flood and there was a deep freeze. And I think we lost more. Probably the, the flood was the more, there was like a, time when it flooded and then froze. And so there was just, um, there was some damage, but um, I would say that most of our, most of the plants we planted are still alive. Um, and I basically go there, I was going every two weeks, but I didn't really need that to just go reset all the tubes and make sure the stakes were in well. Um, I sometimes will come by after the planting and if the tubes were put in upside down, not a big deal. I'll just go like replace them if it's easy. Um, 
uh, or just like fix up the mats or so I'll just go do that basic maintenance. It doesn't take too long. It's actually quite pleasant. And I'm going to show you, I didn't have time to put this into the slideshow, but I'm just going to show you like this. I went there on Tuesday and I took this photo and I think you can see it made me so happy to see this rose hip, I think is what it is from a, um, Virginia Rose just popping up. And I was just like, this is exactly what we do this for. This plant, you know, flowered and fruited and it's thriving. And I pruned it a little. So just so you know, I, I, I saw that broken branch. I had my pruners with me. Um, oh, Chet, you can go to the next page. I just so people can see it's the, the final cup, the final plant list. Our October, 2022 planting was our biggest planting. Um, I, you know, I did it piece by piece because I was like are people going to come like how hard is it going to be to do all this stuff um so we did our but it, I guess I got more confidence and we applied for a larger planting and uh and it was really successful so I, like I showed you the picture like it's really inspiring to go back and check on things and see them thriving and I can't I personally can't wait to see what they look like in five years also um so I think that's it um unless anybody wants to go over any specifics of the um of the items we, we planted. We'll stop sharing now and, and we can go back. Um, and let me just add to what Sue said. I, I have to say that, you know, one, it's a, it's a great project just to putting these new plants in the ground, but what's really fabulous about it was how it dovetailed with the goals we had for working with the village and creating community engagement. That's what's what's really effective, I think, about this Trees for Trips program. And, and, and I have to shout out to Beth. Beth is, is fabulous. Um, and I wish Beth would come to our place every time. You know, <laughs> I know. Beth. I feel like I didn't say it enough. Like I, Beth I, is an I, absolute I was, pleasure. I was very with. frustrated to see all those other places you're doing this with Beth. You should be working with us all the time. So, uh, but it, but it, and, and it, I just another shout out for Groundwork Hudson. Groundwork Hudson Valley uh, actually has a team of high school students from Yonkers called their green team, which they use up and down the Sawmill River to do invasive removal and planting. And they have been a tremendous contributor to this effort. It's really, really great. And, and, um, and so having those pieces together and having this program as a platform has allowed us to take some forgotten, area right along the sawmill and envision it to become a new park. And it's really amazing. So I'll leave it at that. Great. Well, thank you so much, Chet and Sue, for your presentation on your work with Trees for Trips along the Sawmill River. I think it's really helpful to hear the really grounding, no pun intended, of uh, Beth's regional program into this local example and all of the benefits you've seen from it, from habitat and community engagement and creation of, of a new park. Um, we've got some really good questions in here, and I just wanted to mention, um, we've got Jen Benson on tech support today, and she's been dropping some links into the chat. We're going to be compiling all of those and sending those out to you all uh, with a follow-up email along with a recording of this session. So um, look for that in your inboxes shortly after the program. Um, okay, let's get to some of our questions. So are you considering climate change's effects on tree species and recommending a different combination of trees that might have grown there in the past? I think that's for, for Beth. Yeah, it is, and it's a great question. Uh, yes, to the extent that we are able to do that, we, we are trying to do that. Uh, Climate report, which is a report, I'm not sure exactly when it came out, quite a few years ago, but they did some, they made some pretty strong recommendations about different species. Um, one of my staff did some research and we did change the species that we're using based on that. Um, and we do sometimes look at maybe, you know, in in the Northern areas, not putting species that that are at the edge of their range, you know, that, that maybe are gonna get um, pushed out because it's gonna get too hot. Um, but I also, very open to partners making recommendations if they feel there's climate change species. And we did that at, at the Vassar Preserve uh, where they recommended some species that aren't in the range now, but we are expecting that with climate change will we'll be in that range. Great, thank you. And, and Chet and Sue, I wonder if there's any considerations of climate change on the site. You know, you mentioned some of the flooding that you've already seen and some of the need for increased maintenance. Um, is there anything you're thinking about um, at the site in terms of climate change? Well, I, let me start with that. Yes, you can't have a site like that and not think about climate change these days. Um, you know, how it will play out on our specific site is yet to be seen, but I think it's gonna affect the Somo River 
generally. Um, and, and uh, you know, I look, we look to Beth and her team for specific plant suggestions that would reflect climate change. But, you know, our goal, one of our goals is to really strengthen the soil, the riparian soil right along that riverbank with the idea of strengthening it and managing flooding that will change, will change with climate change as it goes on. So how that'll all play out is yet to be seen, but obviously one of our goals is to enhance the native plant setting there that will really uh, hopefully hold the water and that will help protect in the future. I don't know, Sue, if you have more to suggest on that. No, I, same. And I actually, I, I don't know if you remember, Beth, I asked the same question about trees. I was like, are you giving us trees that will be, uh, you know, like, 15 years down the line, are we these going to be out of range? And, and you gave me a similar answer. So she's trustworthy, you guys. Um, but <laughs> uh, no, um, I, I agree with you, Chet, though. I think we can't totally predict. I mean, we can make like uh, a sort of guesses as to what's going to happen, but will that site flood more? I actually was never at that site more five years ago. Like, I don't know what it looked like 10 years ago. Did it flood more frequently then because the way the stream ran down? I, I have no idea, but we can look at what we have right now and try to look at the patterns of uh, from our observation and and hopefully what we're doing will will mitigate some of the, the flooding issues. And I wanted to quickly mention, thank you, Sue, you reminded me, one of the other things we do that that is a great way to, to think about climate change as far as species is concerned is putting more than one or two species at each site. So we're putting 10 to 15 different species at each site. And that way, if there is a new pest that comes along or some species that isn't surviving, um, we have something to back it up. Um, and that's both good for you know just rest, restoration in general, but also dealing with climate change. Yeah, thank you. Um, so sort of building off of this idea of the flood risk and some of the erosion, we've got a question about uh, removing invasives and whether that contributes to erosion. I know this can be complicated. Yeah, and, and I, I think I, I didn't have a lot of time to go into all those details. Certainly, if you have a site where there's a lot of invasives right along the edge, we want to think about erosion. Um, some of the ways of dealing with that is removing a little at a time or removing it right before you replant it. Um, looking at the, I mean, it depends on the extent of the erosion and the specific situation. I also do want to mention that there's a big movement now to maybe not include, not in, take out every single invasive. And, and I think that that's really true. Um, they, you have to look at what your goals are and what the situation is on the site and decide if that invasive is getting in the way of your goals or not. And sometimes if it maybe is not, and it's not causing a major problem for you, it might be something that you're going to leave there. Um, or, or maybe manage over a much longer period of time where you plant a little and remove a little bit. Um, and that it's so site specific. It's a great, we will, we will have that conversation with you. And if we have concerns, we definitely can talk through that. You know, on our site, uh, as, as Sue mentioned, we, our first planning was not right on the river, right on the riverside. It was further in and kind of getting those plants established. And we moved closer to the river and we would go in and remove invasives just either shortly before or the day we were doing the planting and making sure our plantings then were like being, re were replacing those invasives. The reality is, however, removing invasives is challenging and they are gonna be coming back and we're gonna be out there. And so uh, we say removing invasives, that's a little bit of a wordplay. We are trying to dampen them down, allow these native plants to come in and strengthen the soil so it will stop any potential erosion. But they're going to be combined in that area for a long time to come. And, and I think that's just the reality of the site. Well, continuing that line of conversation, these questions are really aligned with our conversation here today. Um, is, is the goal of planting the native plants in response to the invasives to have the native plants spread? Have you seen plants spreading on their own in past projects? And uh, how, can, how can we enable this with all of the deer population and the challenge of deer browse? Yeah, and, and definitely is a big challenge. And I'm not saying that we've perfected it. I think people who land, manage land everywhere are continuing to work on this challenge. Uh, the, to answer the first question, yes, we have seen plants spread. 
Um, there are certain species that we expect to plant one and get one, and there's other species, uh, specifically some types of willows and some, some of the rose uh, species that we see spread at many sites. And the roses are great because the deer don't like them as much. So nothing is deer completely deer proof, but they tend to be more deer resistant. Um, and so we see them spreading at sites. Um, and taking over more and more space. So yeah, that is the goal. And, and for things like trees that we tend to plant one, get one, but eventually they will seed in, we hope. Um, I don't, we haven't completely solved that. Certainly there is a problem with deer eating all the small plants and that's why we're using tubes. Um, uh, but there are options for small exclosures and things like that. And we can talk to individuals about what might work for their site to try to get natural regeneration as well as what we're planting. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions here about structures. So um, there's a question about why is planting near structures not eligible? It might be important if there's no over or understory. And then another question about maybe past structures, um, if there's any screening for the presence of archeological sites before planting, especially on some of these larger projects. Yeah, um, so Yes, it is not eligible to plant too close to a structure and or to have a structure between you and the stream. That said, um, and I didn't mention this, but there is a um, DEC has an urban and community forestry program, and they specialize in in street trees and neighborhood trees and things that are next to you know thinking about what you might want to put near a structure. And so it's an alternate program that would think about that. Um, so it's not something that we're doing. Um, it, it, it's a little bit too quick and dirty. You really have to think about where the roots are going and those kinds of, and how it might affect the, the structure. Um, very site specific too, though. Um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, what was the second part of that question? Uh, if there's any screening for the presence of archeological sites before planting. Yeah, um, I mean, certainly if we have any reason to believe that there's something there, we, we would encourage the, the uh, applicant to do that work, um, I'm I'm not able to do that work. Um, it hasn't come up, except for maybe once, and they they had it cleared. Um, but um, certainly, if you have a site that you know has historical um, concerns, we we would we would ask you to do that work before, either before applying or at least before planting. So you could apply and and do that at the same time. And it is it is a conversation. We don't just you know, you give us the application and we can have a back and forth and figure out what's going to work. Great. Thank you. Well, that brings us to the end of our hour. And I just want to thank our presenters so much, Beth, Chet, and Sue, for talking about the Trees for Trips program, specifically the Hudson Estuary Trees for Trips, but also some of the opportunities available statewide as well. And then, of course, uh, the new park in the village of Dobbs Ferry, which um, Sounds fantastic. Look forward to hopefully visiting at some point uh, and seeing all the work that you've been doing there. So again, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We'll be back on March 9th at 8.30 and our feature presentation will be on Hudson River Greenway grants. So opportunities for municipal planning around watershed and water related projects. So thanks so much and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you, Sue and Chad, I appreciate you. Thanks Beth. Thank you. Thanks Emily.